Can dogs really learn to talk to us? Good. Who is good? Yeah, bunny good. I don't know about you guys, but I've seen yes, these videos good. on social media of this dog who can supposedly use buttons to talk. And I'm constantly wondering the question, how could this possibly be? Come tug? Okay. Let's play tug. Let's play tug. Let's play tug. Yeah. Hey, Toby dog. Hey, Abby dog. How are my large white farm dogs doing? Come here, guys. Come here. Hi. Hi. All right, come on, guys. Inside. Let's go. Good dogs. Good dogs. Come on. Abby dog, why you got the zoomies so much? Huh? What's with the zoomies, huh? You got lots of zoomies this morning, huh? Mr. Toby Dog, you're being very chill this morning. It's good to see. Hi to both of you. Yes. Oh, you are such good large white farm dogs. Stories told with Morgan Gold. With Morgan Gold, it's time for Stories Told. In a confession that will probably surprise no one, I talk to my dogs a lot. And I mean like a lot, a lot. Like there are certain days when beyond my wife, the creatures that I'm talking to the most are my two livestock guardian dogs, Toby Dog and Abby Dog. Hey, large white farm dogs. I've got treats for you guys. Here you go, brush your teeth. I mean, I've had dogs ever since I was a kid and always I would talk to those dogs. And usually people think about talking to animals as something that children mature out of and adults don't need to talk to animals. But I've actually found that having the ability to talk to my dogs is more important now than it has ever been in my entire life. And while it's clear that talking to my dogs is important to me, I think the real question that exists out there is how important is it to talk to your dogs to your dogs? Like, can your dogs actually listen to you and understand you beyond just the basic training commands? And even more curiously, if dogs had vocal cords, would they actually be able to tell you what they were thinking? Like I'm looking at Abby right now and she's lying on her back, giving me her belly, Toby Dog, meanwhile, is looking away. I am very confused and I'm very much going to wonder what both of them want to convey to me. I mean, I'm assuming that Abby wants me to rub her on her belly. I think Toby wants me to pet him on his back. But those are entirely just educated guesses and I actually don't know for a fact what they want from me. And so, yes, that thought experiment of what if my dogs could talk definitely is something that's always on my mind. Well, I actually have this friend and her name is Alexis. I'm a little bit of and she trained her dog, Bunny, how to talk. Yeah, I know she doesn't have vocal cords, but Bunny has definitely learned how to talk to Alexis and communicate with her by use of these little clicky buttons that actually will say a word. But through some patience and some practice, Bunny has a way of communicating with Alexis, and it does kind of answer the question, what if dogs could talk? Now, I'm pretty sure you're seeing these video clips of Alexis talking with Bunny, and you're wondering how the heck did this happen? How did she do it? And maybe if you could do it with your own dogs. And so I decided to have a conversation with Alexis to learn a little bit more. I wouldn't say that I had any dogs growing up that were mine, um, but they, we had a couple of family dogs. There was a Doberman named Darby, and then we had a Bouvier named Bear, um, so I wasn't super involved with either of those dogs. Like, you know, I would give them scratches and, you know, if we were out walking, I would go walking with them, but they weren't really my dogs. I didn't have the same goal and intention with them that I have now with my own three dogs. It was something I'd been thinking about for a long time, but it just hadn't been sort of situationally appropriate. Like I hadn't uh, been financially stable or I was moving around a lot or, um, you know, whatever, didn't have a steady job, whatever the case may have been, but it was always something in the back of my mind that I was um, ready to explore and excited to explore. And then finally, a time came where, you know, I owned my own house and I had a stable job. I was working for myself and everything, all the pieces were in the right place. And so I asked my partner, what would you think about getting a dog? And he said, no, nope, no, thank you. And so that was that. And um, every year would be, you know, something sort of similar. Like, what do you think about getting a dog? What do you, nope, no thanks. And then one year he said, well, maybe a small one. And so I brought home a 50 pound dog. Well, of course she was tiny when I brought her home, but that was all the yes I needed from him. I started researching immediately. And 
I was so excited. My whole goal was to have this sort of like Lassie-esque relationship, right? I wanted to have the closest connection I possibly could with a non-human and the best possible communication. Uh, I didn't know anything about dogs, really, at that point in time. I didn't know anything about training or behavior or um, how to live with a non-human in uh, an ethical way. So I just started researching. I uh, looked for trainers using harm-free methods, and I did some very cursory studying of canine body language. And I was like, oh, yeah, I got this. This is this is so easy. Man. And um, yeah, when I brought Bunny home, I had maybe like a month or two before I actually bringing her home, I had uh, come across a speech language pathologist on Instagram that was using buttons uh, that you could record words onto to uh, teach her dog how to communicate using English words. And I was like, oh, well, what an amazing thing to add to our repertoire of things to explore. So I had a button by the door waiting for her when she came home. I recorded outside on it. And every time we went outside, I would press the button outside and I would stay outside and we would go outside and we'd have a little outside party. And I did that, you know, several times a day, day in, day out for about three weeks. And one day my partner and I were sitting in the living room watching Netflix or something. And Bunny was uh, sitting over by the door right by her button. And she was sort of looking down at it and looking back up at us, looking down at the button and back up at us. And I was watching her out of the corner of my eye. And then she lifted her paw and smashed the outside button herself for the first time. And her head whipped up and her ears flew out. And she had this like gleeful sort of look of surprise. And I screamed and we ran outside and we had a big outside party. And that's all it took for me to become really invested in continuing this sort of training because I you know, I didn't know if it was going to work. I didn't really have any expectations of success, but we're up to about 100 buttons now, and she's been able to communicate some pretty remarkable things to me. Why? Why rain? Oh, boy. That's a good question. Well, I don't know how to explain that to you with the words, you know. Because planet Earth needs water that's crazy so i mean that's a big leap though right like you know i think most new dog owners are like focused on well i gotta make sure it doesn't go to the bathroom in the house and you know <laughs> sit and stay and maybe leave it like like the basics of obedience like that's always the, the focus but for you to kind of jump at that right out of the gate like like what was the the motivator there to like really focus in on trying that language connection that's how I approach everything in life, honestly. I'm I'm very much all or nothing. Um, I get hyper fixated and just develop a passion. And then that's all I can think about. And I want to do everything I can to, you know, make it materialize. So I approach that in the same way, maybe with even more fervor, um, knowing that this is a living being, you know, this isn't just like a hobby. This is a living being with feelings and um you know, and she's quite a, a complicated little beast, as I learned, you know, right around social and sexual maturity. She's got a lot of really big feelings. Where is ouch? Hmm? Use your words, Bubba. I need to know. This is important. Bunny has recurrent episodes of hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, and I could tell one was on the way. She'd been using the word ouch. Feel, feel concerned. A lot. Why Bunny feel concerned? Hmm? Since gastrointestinal tract isn't one of our buttons, she always has a hard time, a really hard time, describing what this pain feels like for her. Big ouch concern. So I'm around animals constantly. I have, you know, two dogs, three cats, I don't know, 30 ducks, 30 geese, 30 chickens, about a dozen cattle. Like, so I'm, I'm always talking to the animals, but other than like my one cat here who will like meow back or like the dogs who will definitely seem to acknowledge and respond to the talking, most animals kind of ignore you. So like, are you a believer that animals can create a connection with language or is it something that that's just kind of more humans perceiving animals creating that connection? Well, we know that animals can learn words. Um, the meanings for any given word might be a little bit different based on who the recipient of the word is. But, you know, ask any dog guardian who has to spell W-A-L-K around their dog, 
like you don't even have to intentionally teach them words for them to learn words. Um, it's just like associative learning and it happens all the time. And I think a lot of animals are capable of that. Or let's say an object like a ball, um, it's pretty easy to build the association. This round thing is a ball and we sort of have the same derived meaning of that ball. When we're talking about more complex concepts, say feelings, um, it's really hard to say what their experience of that word is. But as you learn about your individual dog and as you learn about canine behavior as a whole, I mean, you really can tell. You're like, oh, my dog is very afraid right now. Oh, my dog is very, very happy right now. You know, you get to know them, right? So when Bunny seemed to be experiencing an approximation of what I would cons consider happy, that's when I would take the opportunity to model the word happy on her board. Are you happy now? I love you too, baby. You know, several weeks of that or a month of that or whatever, she starts to use it on her own in seemingly contextual ways. So when she seems happy, she uses the button happy. So my sense is that her understanding of the word isn't so dissimilar from my understanding of it that it can't be used in communication. The same could be said for you and I. Like I could say, I love this thing. And you could say, oh, I love it too. But we probably have different ideas of like how we love it or what that love means or encompasses, you know? Yeah, I completely like so um, both of my dogs, they will like, you know, often have this kind of behavior where they'll just take their paw and they'll like smack me on the leg. And it's it's quite literally, hey, pay attention to me. Like, I want your attention on me. And because I've responded to it over the years, it's become this ingrained behavior. And while, yeah, yeah they're not a, a, like attaching language to it, but like that specific behavior is clearly communicating something that I can interpret. And so like it almost seems like the buttons that you use with Bunny are, are kind of a similar thing where it's like because you've responded in a certain way over time, she's now realizing that the kind of like that stimulus creates that response in you. So like like there's that connection just from the action, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think what's so magical about this process to me is that it's really facilitated a sort of active listening because I have to know what sort of things she would want to quote unquote talk about in order to add words that she will actually use, right? Like if someone was creating uh, a word board for me and they put a button with the word moist on it, I would never use it, right? They're not listening to me. That's not a word I like. Um, so the same goes for Bunny. Like if I, if I put a word on there that isn't something that's salient to her experience in the world, she's not going to use it. So what I have to do as her guardian is really be watching and listening and interpreting uh, her different emotions to the best of my ability in relation to the environment around her and choose buttons based on those experiences that will help her come to terms with her world. I'm curious, like, so what are her favorite words? Uh, she likes UG a whole lot. Um, she Like UG likes... the boot or like UG like UGS? <laughs> like UG. Yeah, like UG. She uses it very frequently when it comes to otter her brother who is her um he's a standard poodle and he's got like big uh ken and barbie energy he's like let's go to the beach beach man beach i mean he's a hoot but he's a lot and so she gets you know annoyed and she'll press ug 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 oh my god Uh, she likes to ask why quite a bit. Um, and, you know, as she has grown, her uh, word interests have shifted, which makes sense. Um, when she was about two years old, poop was by far her favorite word. I know you want to go poop. Okay, we'll go for a poop walk. She would ask me where I went poop. She would call my partner out for pooping. She would talk about guest pooping. She would make fart jokes, saying play poop. She was just poop everything all the time. Poop play? Is that what a fart is? Is a fart poop play? What's a dog fart joke like? Um, well, uh, so 
dogs laugh and you can you can kind of hear it. It sounds almost like a pant, but it's a little bit more forceful air. And you'll see this like loose, open mouth, soft eyes. So she would do that. And then she would uh, softly wag her tail and stare at me and get this look in her face like, are you listening? And then she would press play poop. And then she would toot. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that means fart. I actually have uh, the button that you sent me. Uh, and, yay. you know, my, my dogs, they're livestock guardian dogs, which are yeah. always really, really independent, but also really hard to train, too. And so I've tried to get them going and haven't had too much luck yet. But it yeah. has made me think over and over again as I've been spending time with them over the last couple of weeks of like, like, well, what are they actually thinking about? Like, I know when there's yeah. certain stimulus and response, like I, I can, you know, pretty clearly say, oh, they're, they want my attention or, oh, they are annoyed because they can hear some animals off in the distance. And, and that's why they're very focused on that fence. Or, you know, like Toby, my male, he will like go pee on every fence post. And he's like, oh, that, that post has been unmarked for too long. I need to, to mark it. <laughs> like I, I can tell that that's what he's thinking. But other times when he's just having his downtime and he's just kind of sitting in the sun and like, you know, resting on the hill, like I often wonder like what's actually going through his head. And, and, but you know, the language piece does seem like a magical way to kind of get a little bit more insight out of like what your dog's actually thinking. Dogs are communicating all the time, right? They say so much without words. If we are just willing to listen and learn from them, a lot of their signs aren't super clear to us at first. They can be quite subtle, um, but they're constantly talking. And I think that uh, the benefit of the buttons for us has been mainly in helping Bunny's anxiety because, well, and part of this may be because she's got some old English sheepdog in her, um, but she really has a need to be in control. She really likes her routine. She likes things to be calm and organized and sort of set. Uh, and so if things are out of order, out of control, uh, one of the easiest ways for her to, you know, get back from a state of over arousal is to uh, communicate with me about it. Like, what is that? Oh, it's this thing. Oh, okay. I don't have to be concerned. Or she'll say, I'm concerned. And I'm like, I know, baby, let's go look at what you're seeing. And it's just a bird. And that's not the kind of bird that you hate. So we're fine. And I can sort of, sort of talk her off the ledge. So I think labeling things and allowing her to label things in her environment has been really, really crucial to her mental health. And also her ability to tell me when she's physically unwell has been a game changer. Um, I added an ouch button early on and, uh, you know, didn't really have a need for it at that point in time, but I figured I would take any opportunity wherein I was injured or she was injured to model it, right? So I had a bunch of tattoo work done and she could smell that. And I was like, oh, mom, ouch, mom, ouch, and model the button. And she got spayed. I was able to model it then. Um, and then one day she was over at the buttons and she said, mad ouch, strains your paw. And she walked over to me and she put her paw in my hand and there was a foxtail which is one of those uh, grass awns that was stuck in between her toes and I was able to remove it for her. And that was a really powerful moment for me because dogs evolutionarily are, you know, sort of inclined not to show any signs of weakness or pain because it, you know, makes them appear weaker. So for her to be able to use her words to tell me that something was going on, um, I don't know, it felt revolutionary to me. It was definitely game changing. I, I could totally see that. So, so my other dog, Abby, like uh, this summer, she got a cut on her paw and I didn't really notice it much, but then I noticed that she started suddenly limping and like, she was like holding back and it was like, Oh, what's going on? And I had to like really investigate and look at it versus like, you know, cause she's almost trying to hide it from me. Cause like, when yeah. I'm like, Hey, come, let me look at this. Let me, let me see what's going on, sweetie. And it was like, no, no, you can, you can stay away. I'm just going to go over here now. Like she was like actively trying to avoid me because of it. I think, yeah. Like to be able to open that connection up to like, like have a dog express what they're, they're dealing with. Yeah. That does seem like a game changer. It does. And it also is like a, uh, a show of a foundation of trust, right? Because there's no way that if she hadn't trusted me that she would have sort of willingly placed her paw in my hand. So that, felt like a milestone as well. Like, okay, I've developed the relationship in a, 
in a positive manner. I want to keep going down this path and keep exploring the roads that we are. You know, I grew up as a kid. I had dogs. But then for most of my adult life, you know, kind of from like 18 to I guess 38, 39, I didn't have any pets or animals. Then moved to the farm, get some cats, get some ducks. And then I got my first dog. And it was like, okay, I want to do everything I possibly can perfectly. And, you know, he's going to be the best. And the experience I had with him, like Toby, he was like, you know, he really fit in really well. He, he took to training really well, even though he's much more independent and like, you know, kind of wants to do his thing, but he knows what his job is and he knows kind of what the rules of the job are. The second dog I got, I kind of went into it expecting, oh, it's going to be the same exact thing. I'm ready to go. Whereas like Abby, her personality is completely different where she's way more responsive to training and she's easier to like do like commands and that sort of thing. But then, you know, she doesn't have like the same like, you know, judgment of a livestock guardian dog. And so having to adapt was like one of the biggest learnings I had to do with working with her, recognizing that you can't use the same playbook for each dog and just assume it's going to be the same way. You need to adapt to meet the dog where they're at. Yeah. I don't, it's, it's so silly in hindsight, but like they're obviously such individuals. Right. And it seems like common sense. Like you wouldn't assume that you're going to raise one child. Like you're going to raise another child. Like that doesn't make sense. But I think uh, a lot of people have that feeling about dogs. Like this is the protocol you follow to have a dog that is like, likes to like sit by your side and, you know, go on walks with you. And it's just so much more complicated than that if you're doing it right. When you say kind of doing it right though, like in your eyes, what are the the big pieces that, that kind of represent that right? Yeah. I think the main piece is really keeping in mind that companion animals are captive animals. And they don't have much agency, you know, by far and away, we control every aspect of their lives. And I feel like we really owe it to them to give them as much choice and agency as we possibly can. So in Bunny's case, I let her decide where we want to go for walks. I offer her species specific enrichment. Does she want to dig today? Does she want to shred? Does she need to chew? Well, I can't give her much choice in food. Yeah. <laughs> She's on a prescription diet, but that's another thing that I I would like to give her choice about. But I really try and just offer, you know, and she she doesn't have to say yes to a walk. She can say no to a walk too. Um, So just making sure that species-specific needs are met and that we are providing them with opportunities to be enriched. And I think that's missing in a lot of companion animal home species. I, I think that that's such a big distinction too, because, you know, like, so my dogs are working dogs, right? So yeah. like they're outside right now, they've got about a 10 acre pasture that they're in. They can kind of do whatever they want within, you know, reason within that space. And yeah. they have like a job to do. I could yeah. never imagine like trying to bring particularly that breed, but like, you know, for them not to have that responsibility and then like the amount of anxiety I could see it producing would probably be off the charts. Oh, yeah. I'm imagining like a, a chattel dog in a, you know, Manhattan high rise, like the environment. I mean, that's another thing, like the environment should as best we can match the dogs selected for purpose, right? There are dogs that were bred to be companions in small spaces and just want to be sort of carried around and stay in our laps. And there are dogs like livestock guardians that probably won't thrive in an environment where they can't do that job. One of the things I honestly always worry about and like so the Marema breed which is what both of my dogs are and even though they're very very different they're very much the same breed like I worry that as I put content out on social media and people see the dogs they're like oh those dogs look so great and they see they have such great personalities I love them I want to get one of those where yeah like 95% of context it would be a complete disaster to bring like them into like a suburban neighborhood or a Manhattan apartment. Um, Do you have concerns with that as you think about like Bunny and as you showcase her and people see her skill set and see what she can do for them to say, oh, I just want to get that dog or that type of dog without thinking about some of those context things? Absolutely. And I mean, I am very upfront about uh, the struggles I've had with her and the challenges and, um, how those can potentially be avoided in other people's scenarios. So I speak a lot about that. There's only so much you can do, you know. Bunny is a very, very cute dog. And um, and I got her because she was a very cute dog and because poodles are really smart and old English sheepdogs are really smart. Um, You know, so I I wasn't making good decisions there. I thought I I was. 
And the breeder I selected is not a terrible breeder, but, um, you know, I have since done better research, learned more, you know, no more, do, wait, no better, do better, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think as a person with influence, it, um, we have to be careful about how we present our lives to an audience that might make decisions based on, you know, what they what they see. Ain't it the truth? The thing that I feel like I completely ignored when I didn't own a dog is just how much of a connection you can create and how that connection actually helps you understand yourself just a little bit better. Oh, it's bananas. Yeah. I've learned a tremendous amount about myself and I've been able to reconcile some years long trauma uh, because of the relationship I've developed with Bunny and because of how much I've had to think about the emotions underlying behaviors, not just hers, but mine. It was sort of revelatory for me and allowed me to like look back at some of my past experiences and reframe them. It's definitely made me a better listener, not just to non-humans, but also to humans. I just listen in a different way now. I listen more completely, right? I'm not just like listening to the words. I'm watching the full picture. I'm watching the body language. I'm thinking about the history. You know, I'm trying to take it all in. You you really can't quite develop some of the patience and understanding without like doing some of that introspection. And and it is the magic of, of having a dog as as really a companion. So now you, you mentioned, you know, kind of you started with the outside button and having it by the door and and like that experience like kind of got Bunny going with with the buttons. But like talk a little bit about how did you ultimately expand to the vocabulary that she now has, which is like you said, it's like a hundred words or something, right? Or Yeah. So I started with um, like objects and places that were really simple to model, uh, like the beach. And I would walk out to the beach and I'd say, this is beach, beach, beach. We'd come back inside and press beach, 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 and a ball and like a tug toy um, um, and like a couch, things like that, that seemed really sort of like a one-to-one, -one, this is going to be a piece of cake for her. And then I, I felt that it was really important to start exploring some other concepts because she can tell me when she wants to go outside. She doesn't need a button for it. She can just walk to the door. You know, she can tell me when she wants to play ball. She'll just go grab it. Um, so I started adding uh, happy and concerned and ouch and seeing what that would feel like to model. And if I was in tune enough with her to really get an accurate sense of what she was feeling, and that sort of bolstered my um, my excitement to move forward because I, at that point, was like, oh, I, I am quite in tune with her and this is working and we're, we're having um, this really beautiful back and forth and I feel like she's learning and, and the more she sort of opted into using buttons with me, the more I felt this really strong sort of desire to learn everything I possibly could about training and behavior. So I just started studying. So it really sort of scaffolded. Uh, she would take a step forward and I would take a step forward. She would step forward and I would step forward. Wow, that's pretty cool. And now as you look out there now, like, is there like a growing community of folks who are, are really using buttons to train their dogs? There are so many folks out there. And it's one of the most beautiful communities I've ever been a part of. They're so supportive of each other and they all sort of live by this ethos that they want to allow their dogs to live as dogs and they want to provide them with their species specific needs and they want to, you know, they're all using cooperative care. They're all trying to give them as much agency and choice in their lives as possible. And um, it's also a study. I don't know if you were aware of that, but uh, it's the largest citizen science uh, canine cognition study ever attempted right now. So, so like, yeah. what's what are the objectives of the study, basically? To see uh, if uh, and if so, how and how much animals are capable of communicating in language-like ways. Mm-hmm. We're in phase three right now. Uh, I think there are several thousand active participants and many more enrolled participants. It's going on through the Comparative Cognition Lab at UCSD, headed by Federico Rossano. And there are a couple papers under review currently, which is pretty exciting. But I think it'll just be ongoing 
you know, ad infinitum because we're learning so much along the way. For for folks who would want to start experimenting with buttons with their dogs, like what what are the tips that you'd have for them there? Yeah, I mean, I would say start talking to your dog. Like talk to your dog like they're a person, maybe a little bit slower. Uh, keywords, like we were saying earlier, dogs are going to learn the words regardless. But if every time you go outside, you stay outside. If every time you go to the park, you stay park. If every time you touch your dog's ear, you say ear, they're going to start to build associations, whether you are intending for that to happen or not. And then you can add a button with those words as well and start modeling it by pressing the button, saying the word, touching the body part, picking up the ball, whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, listening to your dog. So this is the first thing you want to do is, is get to know your dog. You want to understand what makes them tick, right? Not all dogs uh, are going to want to go for a swim. Not, you know, so maybe don't put a swim button for a dog that just wants to sit by the fire. Uh, so know your dog, understand what might motivate them, and then you can choose words to start modeling for them. Paw targeting is really helpful for a lot of learners. So if you teach a dog how to touch something with its paw, um, that's going to be a behavior that they offer more regularly. So if you're wanting your dog to use the buttons with their paw, you can teach them paw targeting on other objects, and that might encourage them to touch the buttons with their paws. Some dogs use uh, word boards that are on the wall, and they use their noses to boop them. So that's another way you could teach a target. But I think the most important thing is is really listening and uh, talking, labeling things. Now, do you have to start as a puppy or can a dog be really any age? And do, do, do different dogs have different ability there? We are seeing learners of all ages have tremendous success. Um, and there are plenty of, of uh, not dogs <laughs> that are using things as well. There's a bunch of cats. Um, there are a couple of horses, uh, at least one cow. Um, it's a monkey, a pig. So there are a lot of non-humans that are uh, giving us shots. And uh, I don't think age matters. I know that in humans, there's this critical language learning period that doesn't seem to be the case with dogs. And, you know, all dogs are different. Some dogs, you know, might not be interested in communicating this way. And some dogs might be very interested in communicating this way. And I don't think it's a matter of intelligence um for bunny i think you know the thing that really compels her to communicate using the buttons is her anxiety um otter uses the buttons only for evil um he'll, <laughs> he'll like go over to the board if bunny's like chewing a bone or something he'll go over to the board and he'll be like outside beach and i'll be like okay buddy i'll walk to the door and he'll run to the door bunny will be like oh yeah we're going to the beach and as soon as Bunny gets to the door, Otter runs and steals her bone. So that's his demo. You know, they they all use them differently and have different motivations for using them. But uh, I think you can find success in a lot of different ways with them. So, but it, it, like like you're saying though, it gets back to kind of you got to really listen and pay attention to the animal first, and then kind of adapt to what their interest and ability is. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, for me, it's never been about teaching the dog to talk. It's always been about finding this deeper level of connection. Um, and, you know, the buttons were sort of a conduit for that, as well as for finding a deeper connection with myself, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, if your motivation is connection, I think the, the rest sort of happens fairly naturally. So yes, I got to say, I am completely intrigued by this method of communication with your dogs. And in fact, after I talked with Alexis, I went out and bought a box of those training buttons and I'll probably try it out with my dogs. If you guys want to see a future episode, either here on this channel or on my other YouTube channel, definitely let me know down in the comments or in the, uh, the review section of this podcast. And by the way, I should probably take a moment to talk housekeeping wise about a couple things. Number one, if you want to learn more about Alexis's book, you should definitely check it out. It's available now absolutely everywhere. I'll leave some links down below for you to take a look at it. I read it and fell in love with it and am just fascinated what she's able to do with Bunny and her views on the world and how to communicate with animals. And so much of the book isn't just a how-to, but really about the journey that many new dog owners go on. And yeah, I, I just 
definitely recommend you check it out. Also, if you like books about dogs talking, last year I actually published a book about my dog, Toby Dog, and it's a novel of sorts about him coming to our farm and learning the ways of being a livestock guardian dog. Now, full disclosure, this is actually a work of fiction, but if you enjoy animals and talking dogs, you definitely might want to check it out. And then finally, I will say, this is actually the first official new episode of my new podcast. So I've typically had a podcast that was called the Goldshaw Farm Podcast. And over the last, I don't know, six to nine months, I've been kind of morphing what it is. And this is now the new home. And the new, new, new version of this podcast is now called Stories Told with Morgan Gold. Stories Told with Morgan Gold. With Morgan Gold, it's time for Stories Told. I'm realizing I probably need a new theme song. And so if anybody has any suggestions, let me know down in the comments. If, if you're listening to this podcast right now, you don't have to do a thing. Just there'll be new episodes popping up pretty much on a weekly basis. Some of them are going to be taking some of the longer form video essays I'm also doing on my new YouTube channel, Morgan Gold, and turning them into podcasts where I dive a little bit deeper. Others are going to be just sort of pure podcast episodes like the one that you got today. It's going to be a little bit of a hodgepodge and mix and match, but the goal is to always give you a good story, give you something interesting, and give you something entertaining. And so uh, that is what you're going to start seeing on the regular basis. But what I will ask of you is if you're enjoying this, please write a review because, you know, the, the YouTube algorithm gods will do their thing with the videos that I post but podcasts are so dependent on their listeners to really help spread the word and, and share this with other folks. And so whether you're sharing it on social media, whether you're writing reviews wherever you get your podcast, anything you could do to help us out, it really would mean the world to us. And so thank you for listening and I'll be back real soon. And thanks a lot and have a great day. Well, isn't that great? An entire podcast episode dedicated to talking to dogs and nobody asks Abby a single question. Great.